today we're going to be covering dovetails, just basic dovetails. I'm just preparing a couple of boards so we can do some dovetailing. What I've seen in the past is people machine, excuse me, machine the timber up, then cut the dovetails and then realise they've still got machining marks on their timber, whether it's joined of blades or thickness of blades or tear out or anything like that, I'll sand it out later. Unfortunately, if, you, if you're doing dove tails for a, the box, pff, not a drama. If you're doing it for a drawer, however, can present problems because you're reducing the thickness of the side of the drawer. So even though you put it together initially, you've got a really nice tight fit. And here's a, here's a little bit of trivia for you. On the white star line, of which the Titanic was one, the carpenters on there, the uh, head foreman, to check the drawers on the bedside tables or any, any drawers, the test used to be get your finger, bottom right hand corner of the drawer, and push it in. And if it didn't catch, it was a good drawer. If it caught, it meant the drawer was too uh, narrow and it was kinking in the cavity, or if it wouldn't go in, it was too wide and it needed something taken off. If you get into the habit of finishing it and, or sanding it, planing it, whatever, to size before you actually measure the dovetails because it will make a difference to the mating parts. So I think I'll just about finish that. These ones are done. I'll pop that up there. Oh, okay. And I must admit, I just, it's nice, isn't it? Better than noisy machines. The dovetails really, they're a very a basic joint, but over, I don't know, maybe the last 50 years, well, I'm dating myself now, but definitely since the 80s, the dovetails become more of a, a showpiece joint than an actual structural joint, even though it is a structural joint. It's a compression joint and it works exactly the same as the keystones that masonries, masoners use in archways. If you look at an archway, there's a dovetail shaped keystone in there and that holds the arch together. So it's got the weight of the stones leaning on it and that wedge shape locks it together so the wall stays up. Much the same with dovetails. They're a compression joint and used in drawers, when you pull the drawer, it actually locks into itself and that keeps the drawer front off. If you just had a butt joint on there, over time that would weaken and you'd pull the drawer front off. There are a couple of other variations in drawer construction, but dovetails I think are the most common. And now what was I looking at the other day? Apparently there was a Roman fresco going back um, I, I don't even know the, the day, but let's face it, if I get past last week, it's all ancient history, but let's say 100 years BC. And there was a fresco and a carpenter was working on a job and he was actually cutting a dovetail. So they've been around for a long, long time. You might be familiar, people go, oh yeah, I'm doing a dovetail and it's a six in one or an eight in one. They're the two main sizes you find when you're doing furniture, for example, or boxes. Uh, boxes are a different kettle of fish, but we'll cover those later on. Uh, so how do they arrive at 6-in-1 and 18-in-1? It's easy. My, just off the, uh, off the record, not off, no, it's, it's on the record because it's on a stream, isn't it? For your information, my preferred dovetail is a five and a quarter in one. There is a uh, a secret dovetail, Japanese dovetail joint I do, and that actually is a four-in-one. And now a six-in-one is actually, it's the same as a gradient on a hill. It's six inches up, one inch in. So if we come in one inch on this piece of paper, coming in one inch, and you go up, six inches and you put a mark so we've come in an inch from the edge here to there and we've gone up 
six inches to there. Now if you join that line, that line is a six in one dovetail. And just to double check it, that's a six in one jig. And if we put the jig up to the line, that's it. So that's how they arrive at the different ratios. The lower the number, the wider the dovetail is used for softwood because softwood has a lot of pith and soft grain in it. And as it shrinks and as it gets used, it will compress more. So you might start out with a six in one and after many years of use, it could come down to a five and a half in one. So if you started with an eight in one, which is a narrower dovetail, over time that could flatten out and it wouldn't have that locking effect that uh, the six in one does. I will show you this drawer. I used an eight in one on this one. And there's actually, I think it's 50, 50 odd dovetails. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 46. There you go, 46 dovetails. And all hand cut. And as you can tell, the drawer itself was not straight. But that was an eight in one because that timber I used was, what was it? Red river gum and blue gum. Being a hardwood, I could get away with that narrower dovetail. Hokey dokey. So that's how you work out to make your dovetail. You can make your own jigs. But there are some really good ones on the market. These and I bought these from Carbotech, I think. Gee whiz. Would have been about 30 years ago. So I don't know if they still stock them, but you can always check it out. And they were just anodized aluminium, cut at an angle with the lip on it. So I can use those as jigs. I know they have these. So I was in the shop the other day. And these are really, really nice jigs. And they give you a nice amount to put over your job and you've got nice sharp edges to work against. That's a one in eight and that's a one in six. So they're available. If you're unsure, um, you uh, have problems holding the saw straight, or in uh, my, my dad's case, my dad had Parkinson's, wasn't really severe, but it was enough to give him uh, the tremors. And if you still want to do woodwork, this is fantastic. Just see how wonderful this is. Dad had these, these were around when my dad was alive. I reckon I would have bought him some. That's the angle of the dovetail and look at this. It's a magnet. So you just let your saw against the jig and start cutting and you will be cutting perfect dovetails every time. And that comes in, yeah, a one in six and a one in eight as well. So there's some opportunities for you or oh, failing that if you, you don't want to do the jigs and you want to do it the way I did it, just use a sliding bevel. And what you would do, draw up the angles that you want and then put your sliding bevel on the bottom of the paper or the, the edge of it and then bring it around to follow that slope. Got shadows here, there you go. And that should be pretty darn close to a six in one. There you go. So there are many, many ways of getting your angle. Once you've got your angle, you're halfway there. Now we've got to set it out. Um, oh, let's talk about saws to start with. I'm gonna use a, a Japanese saw for this. You can use, I've actually done a video previously where I used a 
$9.95 shark tooth saw from the big store warehouse just to prove you don't need to have specific saws to do it. I'll, I'll tell you it's a lot easier if you have because you get a finer cut and you've got more control. But if you're starting out, it is not necessary. Japanese saws work well. I like this one because it's got a, a changeable blade and very nice fine teeth. There are the gent saws. These are uh, just packs, gent saws. Now, sometimes I take the, uh, whatever you call it, the kerf off. So it's flat and it gives me a finer cut, but horses for courses. They're, they're not a bad uh, scroll saw, uh, scroll saw, dovetail saw. Then you've got pistol grips, which I, I personally prefer the pistol grips over um, the long ones, but the long ones I've used for many, many years. So that's just a, an ordinary, I don't know, it must have a special name, but I'll call that a long grip. That's a pistol grip. And I'll show you the difference in the teeth between, say, a tenon saw and a dovetail saw. That's a tenon saw. See how fine they are? That's about 22 TPI, I reckon. Am I close? No, 20. There you go. That's a 20 TPI. That's about a 13 TPI. So the finer the cut, the neater the job's going to be. And here's, here's a couple of old paxes, exactly the same thing. Dovetail saws at the top, much finer teeth, and the tenon saw at the bottom. So the finer the teeth, the better you're going to find your, your woodwork. And also, you've got to have sharp chisels. If your chisels aren't sharp, go and sharpen them before you even try to do some dovetails. How to set out dovetails. Let's do some dovetails on this. And first of all, work out how many dovetails. Oh, before I get into that, I'll just touch on, I know there's commercial jigs around that you can use a router on. You can cut. Uh, dovetails on a bandsaw, you can cut dovetails on a table saw and the jigs which you can get, uh, I think there's ones that spring to mind, I think um, there's a Gifton jig, there's a Lee, Lee jig, an Incra jig and I know there's some generic ones out there that you use a dovetail around a bit on if I can find one. And, and again, they come in the same two sizes, a six in one and an eight in one. I think these are both eight in ones. And they're fine. They, they are fine and you'll get dovetails cut with those. The reason I don't like them and I much prefer cutting dovetails by hand is I have more control over the design and the placement of the dovetails. But so often I've seen people, they'll make a box with um, dovetails in it, and then they'll have to cut through a dovetail when they take the lid off, because the jig that they're using only allows them a certain size. Whereas, yeah, I wish I could find the top to that. If you set them out yourself and cut them, you can then design it. I've got dovetails here, and then the lid, I had two smaller dovetails. So when I cut the lid off, that was cut off by hand. When I cut the lid off, it actually didn't cut the dovetail. So when the lid closed, I've got four full dovetails here, and then I've got two smaller dovetails on the roof. That's the through dovetail, where the dovetail goes all the way through. And then you've got a half lap dovetail, which is generally what you have on drawer fronts, because you don't see the drawer dovetails coming through, they're enclosed like that, whereas the back of the drawer is generally exposed. Actually, I'll show you on this one. There you go. So that's the front of the cabinet. The dovetails are on the side, but when you turn it around the back, the dovetails actually go all the way through. I think the through dovetails 
are harder to do than the half lap dovetails. Because the half lap dovetail, you can hide a lot of mistakes. The through dovetail, mm -mm, you can't. All right, so we've covered the different angles, saws, chisels. Chisels have to be sharp. And with a chisel, to do dovetails successfully, you really need to have a bevel chisel. Now this is a, a firmer, and you'll notice it's got square, whoops, it's got square faces on it. Now that's generally for cutting out mortises, whereas a bevel chisel has bevels on the side. And you need that, and you'll see it when we start cutting the sockets out, you need that bevel so you can get in underneath the dovetails and clean them out. So, uh, beveled chisels are the go. Here's another one. This is a Robert Sorby one. And it's got that bevel on there. You can cut mortises with beveled chisels. You can't cut dovetails with mortise chisels. Okay, now setting out. Work out how many dovetails you want. And this also can reflect on the ratio that you set your dovetails at because you might go, oh, I'm going to go six in one and I want five dovetails. And if you do that, all of a sudden um, it looks out of place because they're too wide at the base of the tail. So you might decide, oh, I think I'll go a six and a half or a seven in one. But anyway, needless to say, this is an area that a lot of people spend hours and hours and hours trying to set out dovetails. So I'll show you an easy way. Well, that measures three and five eighths. Let's go metric. It measures 92 mil. And I want to have four dovetails. How do you work out four into that? And I have seen people, you divide it in half and then they'll work back from the centre or they'll measure it and they'll try and step it out with dividers or compasses or whatever. Here is the easiest way I know of setting out dovetails. Doesn't matter how many you want, this method will work without fail. You can use a metric ruler or you can use an imperial ruler, it doesn't matter. If I want um, three dovetails, so I'll tell you what, I must have been working during the week. A gunky week. If I want three dovetails, I can divide this board into three. I don't have to have measurements. It doesn't matter. All I do is the bottom corner here, I have resting up on this edge, and then I'll swing this around until I get a number that is divisible by three. So if I go down to 12, that's one point, that's 120 mil there. Divide that by three. That means I put a mark at the four, and one at the eight, and that's divided into three equal parts. I want four dovetails. I'll use the same thing. Put this right on the corner, swing this around until I get 12 there. I could, I could if I like, I could go to 16. And then mark that off in fours. Four, eight, 12. That gives me one, two, three, four dovetails. If I did the same thing, put it there and we'll go to 1.2. And I mark it off in threes. That's three, six, nine, 12. Now if you have a look at those, those two marks, that one there and that one there are the same spacing, that one and that one's the same spacing. And this one and this one are the same spacing. Again, if you used inches, you could have that there, spin that round to four inches and just mark off one, two, three, four. They're going to be identical. That's how you divide any board up into equal parts. Much easier than guessing and trying to work it out with feeler gauges and whatever. I will mark this quite severely, only so you can see what we're doing. Normally I wouldn't, 
because it's going to mark the job. Once, two. Okay, so you can see those indentations. That's four equal portions. And what I'm going to do now is grab. A square. So bring that one down. Bring that one down. And bring that one down. So now I've got three pencilized, four spaces. Put that in the vise. And what I like to do is just get a knife and just put a little knife cut on each of those lines. But when you're marking and you're using the square, instead of putting the square onto the mark, it's much more accurate to put your knife on the mark, then move your square up to the knife. One mark, square under the knife, knife into the square, There you go. So now we've got one, two, three, four spaces. What I will do, so you can see, I'll actually put pencil in there so you can see the marks. There you go. Now that's giving you the four spaces, but now you've got to draw the dovetails in. And what I do is, and there, look, honestly, if I was running this stream, uh, say I did it over six weeks or eight weeks and it was basically the same thing, showing you how to cut dovetails, I would do it eight different ways. It's not because I want to show you I'm clever, it's the other way around. I can't remember which way I did it. But I know the end result that I want. So don't get locked into there is only one way to cut dovetails. It's whatever way suits you and works for you. The set outs are the same. So if you do it differently, but you get the results you want, hey, more power to you. Keep on doing it that way. Now I'm going back to Imperial because I like eighths of an inch. And these lines, I'm going to draw an eighth of an inch or mark an eighth of an inch either side of that line. And then from the end, come in one eighth from each end. And then I will bring those across. Knife in the mark, draw it down. Knife in the mark, move the square up, draw it down. Knife in the mark, move the square up, make the cut. And on the last one, Good on you. On the last one, you're better off either turning a job around or turning the square around because you're not stable. It's going to rock. So in that case, I just turn that around, put the knife in the mark, pull it down, and I've got to find that mark there. There you go. You can see there now, I've got an eighth of an inch, a quarter of an inch, quarter of an inch, quarter of an inch, and an eighth of an inch. But these tails are still the same width. On these marks, I like to come over again and just bring it down onto the face. The tails themselves aren't as crucial as the sockets or the pins because we'll cut the pins and the sockets or sockets. I prefer calling them pins, I think. UK call them sockets. They have to then fit the tail. So no matter what disaster happens with the tails, providing you make, cut the pins to match, it's going to be good. Now the other thing I do is I've got, I've got a 2B pencil and I mark in the waist because you don't want to get halfway through doing something and you just realise, and I've done it, I've cut a pin out and I've left the waist in. 
So if you just give it a bit of colour like that, you know where the pencil is, is where you have to mark. Audience involvement, do you want me to do three through dovetails or half lap dovetails? Trevor, number one, half lap. Half, okay, half lap is what we'll do. Okay, work out how far you want. Oh, you need marking gauge. It's always good too if you've got three or four marking gauges. I did have four, but I don't know where the other one is. So we'll have to make do with three. On the piece that's going to have the, the pins, you've got to work out how much you want left. So I reckon that's... I'm not even going to measure it. That looks pretty good to me. This is how deep... The tail's going to be. So where we've marked here. Lightly mark a line around here. That's a, a way to always tell if dovetails have been hand cut, if you can't tell just by looking. If you can see a scratch mark or a gauge mark all the way around, you know they're hand, Well, nine times out of ten it means they're hand cut. Okay. I'll do this a bit heavier than I would normally on a job. Only so you can see it. So there's our depth line, and these are the intervals. So now get your marking gauge or your dovetail gauge. So make sure you've got it so you're going to make a dovetail. If I go this way, obviously it's the wrong way because the fattest part of the fan is down the bottom and it won't work. Put the knife in your mark, slide your gauge up to it, do a mark. Then you miss one and then go to the next. Put your mark, miss the next one, do the next one. Miss one and do the last one. Flip the gauge over and go back the other way. Colour that in. So there's a the tail, there's a the tail, there's a the tail, there's a the tail. You can do it on the other side if you desire. Colour in the waist side. That looks pretty darn close, I think. Now, another thing I like to do, which I, I didn't used to do, but as time marches on and your eyes get a bit not quite as good as they were, I like to put a bit of masking tape around that line. If you can divide that gauge line in half and that way, and I, I don't think there's any disgrace in doing this at all, that way you can get to see the line you're working to a lot easier. Now we'll pop it in the vise and we will start cutting. You can um, pre-drill. I've seen people, what they do is they'll drill these bits out to get rid of waste, but quite frankly, why bother? And what size do I use? A Japanese saw. Thing with Japanese saws, remember, they cut on the backstroke. So don't have your thumb behind it like that when you're using it. As I have done. Now, some people, and again, this is personal preference, they will put it in an angle, at an angle like that, so they're cutting straight down. For me, look, just put it this way and get used to cutting at an angle. Because if you ever want to do these freehand, that's what you do, you just put it in there, you cut, excuse me, you cut all one way, turn the saw over, cut the other way, and you've got your angle. Now what we're going to do is cut 
on the waist side of those marks. So don't cut exactly on the mark, just cut a little bit outside the mark. And be mindful if you're watching the back, I like to have the saw tilted a little bit because I'll hit the back here before I hit the front and I should be a little bit high on that masking tape on the, the front that I can come back and do later on. A little technique if you want, if you're doing lap joints particularly, if you just bend the saw slightly so you get a little bit of a camber happening, it does help them fit a bit better. Okay, so there's a first cut. I'm on the line with those, and on this side, I'm a little bit high of that tape. So I'll turn that around, and then I'll just bring them down to that tape line. Just let the weight of the saw do the job. Don't push it. Then we go back the other way. Now put it in the vise this way and we'll cut these ends off here. A little, again, work on the, the waist side of the line. And then we'll clean the rest up with a chisel. Now we've got to remove the waste in between here. For that, there's many things you could use. You can use a coping saw and slide it down and cut the waste out this way. And then you come back the other way. But my preferred method is I like using a much finer blade, and you will see why if I can find the saw. Here we go. And I'll, I picked this one up, picked this one up from Carbotec the other day, and it really is a very nice little saw. It takes, I've got this predecessor here somewhere or other. This is an old, much older version, uh, but it takes a scroll saw blade, a pinless scroll saw blade, and I was really pleased to see that they brought these back. Now that's loose, so what I'm going to do is tighten it, and it's just a hand tighten. Lock the knurl nut up here, and you can hear that. So the reason I like these is when I'm cutting, see how this one I've had to cut down there and I've got a fair bit of stuff I've got to clean up there. Whereas with these, with a very, very fine blade, I can go down and just staying just above the line I've taken all that waste out. So it helps me when I'm cleaning them up. See if you can get hold of one of that's a, what is it? Pegasus adjustable 
SMSA frame. There you go. But they really are nice. <laughs> so what I'll do is I'll... Oh, no, I'll leave that in there because I'll show you how to clean that up. So there's the rough cut dovetails. With me so far. I know it's long-winded, but we're getting there. Steve, why mark on both sides if it is a half joint? Uh, yeah, good point. No real reason. It's just when you're cleaning out, you know that you've got it square because if you've got one side a bit fatter than the other and it's a side you're not going to see, it's not going to fit. So if you can just work to the line on both sides, it makes it easier to fit. Now we're going to clean these up. What I do is I'll get a sacrificial piece of, you can use, you could use a plastic mat or you can use a piece of timber. For me, I prefer using timber and you'll see why. Uh, get a block and all it is, there's a bit of coil, it doesn't matter what it is. But this edge I know is flat and it is square to this surface. That's all you need. Bit of plywood, a squirt bottle, with some water in it, little squirt on the bottom of the job, squirt on the top, squirt on the block, and a light. If you've got a light, that's good to have too, because you can actually see your work then. Move this right up onto that line, and then clamp it to the bedge. Now I know that's square, so if I'm using that as a, a brace from the chisel, I'm going to be cutting square. So I start, actually this one here that I did with the coping saw, it's wider, narrower than 3 8 so I'm going to flare those tails out if I use So I use a quarter inch chisel and I bear down. I'm not going all the way through, I'm just going halfway or just over halfway. Okay. Now I should be able to use a 3 8. Yep. And you can see that's a great example of why you've got to have a bevel chisel. Because the bevels are actually sliding underneath into the taper. So now I'm going to keep the back of the chisel flat against my block and just tear down. There we go. Same here, come away from the block a little bit. Now just tear down. Away from the block. And bring it back. And the same on these end ones. And this is why it's critical that you have sharp chisels or else you're going to be in a world of pain. Get rid of the waste. Turn it over. And you notice we've still got all this bulk here. Sometimes if you go all the way through, you actually get a blowout and it'll pull the timber out from the face, which you don't want to happen. Clamp it down. If you need to adjust that clamp, put sort of even pressure on it and then you can just tap it up onto the line using a hammer. Again, only go halfway, but that should put you into open space. This other one we've got to take a smaller chisel to it to start with. There's always an ongoing argument to, oh, do you cut the pins first or the tails first? Well, I always cut the tails first and 
I can't see any advantage of cutting the pin first, but I can see the advantage of cutting the tails first, especially if you're going to make a sliding dovetail. Again, no right or wrong. I think leaf chisels have cut that many dovetails, they should be able to cut them themselves. Now, come down on the line of the dovetail there. Square them up. Great sound that, isn't it? All right, dovetails are cut. And to be honest, they're, they're the first dovetails I've cut for months. Clean up, if you've got a nice sharp knife, just clean up inside the corners to get rid of any waste that's still there or dags that are hanging on. All right, now we'll lay the pins out. A couple of ways you can do that. Put a plane there, the piece that you're going to put your pins into there. And then lay the tails on the plane like that. But, 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 I'll show you this other great idea, which I think is far better, and you can make it, you can make it. I originally saw this, oh, years ago, must have been 10 years ago at least, uh, David Barron, I think his name is, in the UK. Uh, made one of these, and I don't know what he calls his, I call mine a dovetail sled. And all it is, this one's actually doweled together. Uh, let's see if I can give you a better look. It's doweled together on a mitre joint. You could use the dovetail, we might even do this as a project one day, who knows. And it's got a gutter down here, and then I've got piece of brass strap all the way around and it's at 90 degrees. So what you do with this one is put your pin board in pop it in the vise like that make the pin board level with the deck Tighten it up, get your tails, put it against the rail, then you can bring it up and way to go. It is so much more convenient doing it that way than the other way because you've got a fence here. The plane works fine, but you can knock it off a skew. Whereas when you've got that fence up there and this channel down here, it's to just get any dust or muck that might get in the way. If we need it, we can put a light on top of that so we can see what we're doing. Line it up to the mark. Get a knife. Now this is important that you use a knife when marking the pins. So I said dovetails, it's not as critical. You can use a pencil. But if you start using a pencil line when you're cutting the pins, you can get confused because, oh, do I cut on the inside of the pencil line? Do I cut on the outside? Do I cut on the pencil line? Whereas if you've got a knife, you have a really, really accurate mark. So that's there, holding that nice and firm. You can clamp it if you like. And just draw in your tails. Come back in this way. A bit too far with that, but that's all right. And there you go. Are they all marked? Yep. So what I'm going to do here, if I can, you can see they're cut. I'm going to mark the waist. And the waist is where the dovetails are actually going to go in. 
So I've just got little indentations in there. So now I can bring it over and bring those lines down. And we want them to come down the thickness of this board. You can either put your board on there like that and mark it with a knife. Or if you prefer, this is why I like multiple gauges. Especially if you've got a, if you're doing a lot. You see, if you finish hand planing these, you could be a little bit out. So if you're using a marking gauge, you're gonna have the same distances. Whereas if you just mark it out like I did then, putting a board on, can make a bit of difference. Now we'll just mark down there. You don't have to mark the ends because all we're doing is taking these pins out. Okay, and get some masking tape. If, ow! If, if you want. And now continue these lines down to the masking tape. What I do, put the knife in the slot, move the square up, and then take the knife out and then pull it towards me. That way I'm not going to run the risk of actually coming down on the job. Okay, so what we're going to do now is cut the pins out. Come in at an angle and also the sorting angle. Obviously you can't cut like that. You can, I'll show you a couple of ways of doing this, um, shall I? No, no, we'll cut them first. Now on the waist side, so I'm actually cutting on the inside, on the socket side. And I've got two lines to go to. I've got to go to this back line and I've got to go to this side line. And three lines actually, and the one down the bottom, so. There you go. Other way. Whoop. A little bit loose on that one. Always be mindful to get on the waist side. It's much easier to pair stuff out than glue stuff in. Although I have done it. All right. So we've cut down there, we've cut as close as we can to that line, we've cut on an angle. Next thing is to get the chisels out. You can use a hammer or a mallet, whatever suits your boot. Now come away from the line to start with, make sure you've got the right one. And a couple of knocks. Away from the line. It's very similar to the way you would do a mortise. I've cleared the way so when I put the chisel on the tape line and knock down, there's a cavity there that this material can go into which will give me a sharp cut right on that line. Can you see I'm right on that line? Where if I hadn't have done that relief cut and I did a cut like this right on the line because the design of the chisel, it would push the cut back. So it's very important to remember to put that relief cut in. So now we've started to register down there. What we've got to do is clean out the waste that's on the top. A couple of ways you can do it. You can either put it back in the vise and knock down with a chisel like that. And 
you can see I'm taking all that waste out and then just push forward and clean it out. As it gets wider, obviously, you can use a wider chisel if you want. Now I can just shear that off either straight in like this or what I'll prefer to do is get that block out that I was using before and use that. Use a wider chisel there now I think. Again, I can't stress enough the importance of sharp chisels. I'm just going to refine that. by going right down that cut line we had. Now we started to expose this pin here. That's the socket, that's the pin. I will do it a different way here because it's quicker. Well, quicker for me. said the other day, you should never use the palm of your hand against the chisel. Well, I'm not. I'm using this bony part here against there. I wouldn't use that because it's going to damage it. But if you're using right on the end, it's okay. But again, whatever makes you feel comfortable. When, uh, if you're doing a lot, I actually set them out in batches. So I'd set out, uh, say I had two drawers, that's four fronts. I would set out the fronts in one hit. Just put them all together in the vise and draw them all up in one go. And yeah, it does take time. As I think I said at the beginning, I think it's harder to do a good fitting hatch mortise and, mortise and tenon than dovetails. It's pretty easy, I reckon. Okay. Now we've got the bulk of that out. I'm going to put it back in the vise now and we can do a final clean up, I think. Now I'm right over the top of the job and I'm actually paring down to those mark lines.
And that, to me, is pretty darn good. Uh, if you're tempted, if you're on the mark line and you've got, oh, maybe a mil, don't take it in one go. Creep up on it because you have no idea what that grain is doing underneath. It might look good and then all of a sudden you push down and the grain could have a turn in it and you can actually go right through the other side of the job. Which is annoying. Good to have a little knife that you can clean up with. Also, if you can get one, there's not many of them around, I know, but a one-eighth chisel is something that you can use a lot when you do dovetails. Just getting into the corners. And there are the pins. With me in the corner so you can see my shocked face. There you go. All right. Ready? Get a, um, again, a, a piece of scrap timber. Anything will do. What's that? And place the board in there. Bit of scrap on the top. Gentle tap. See how we're going. Oops. Okay, a little bit on that shoulder to take off. And then I'm going to be pretty happy with that, I think. That was an adjustment, I was just actually taking it down to the line. Who's been in my workshop? There you have it. By the time that's been glued in, that's going to be looking pretty good. There's a the clean front, and there's the dovetails on the side. There you go. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. That was fun. I, 
I just love doing things unplanned. But anyway, that's how you do dovetails. Not hard, just take your time. But uh, what tricks can I give you? Accurate measurement, particularly on the pin side. Uh, oh, I'll tell you what I'll do, we'll, we'll just, I'll do a freehand. Oh, I'll do a freehand um, dovetail. I won't cut it out because you cut it out exactly the same Ooh, way. But mark out, uh, no, we won't even do a mark. I'll just, I'll put a depth mark of how deep I want to go. I might go that deep. And I'll use just an ordinary gent saw, which is where. I don't know how sharp these are. Uh, we'll give it a go. Here we go. All right, this is just freehand. So if you've got nothing and you haven't got any jigs but you still want to do dovetails, this is how you do dovetails. Set yourself up in a comfortable position and find an angle that you uh, are pleased with, basically. And then start, come in about an uh, eighth of an inch. And do your cut. Over here, do another one. Come back the other way. The only reason I'm not using that other saw is because I don't know where it is, I can't find it. So there you go. If you want, that was totally freehand. As I said, that was totally freehand. They're most likely not identical. They might not even be correctly spaced. But if you're in a pinch and you've got to get something done in a hurry, that's a quick way of doing them. And I think that was less than a minute. So anyway, horses for courses. Um, I think that the precision of laying out dovetails, the reason I love dovetails, I guess it's the same reason I love marquetry, is because I can lose myself in it. It's one of those things where you've got to have total focus and all the worries of the world just pass you by and you're in the zone and you're, you're doing woodwork and it's with hand tools and if you're lucky enough you've got an aromatic timber you're working with, all your senses are involved and... Uh, you're creating something, you're using your hands, your mind, and your imagination. And it's woodworking, so it's got to be all good. Thank you all for your company. I think Carpet Tech's still open, you can give them a call. And um, thanks for Carpet Tech too for letting me on 
to your channel and just, I don't know, sharing some of the things that I've learned along the way. I hope it's helpful to you. And uh, I look forward to catching up to some of you in person. Who knows, I might even see you in the store. But until then, I'll sign off in my usual fashion and say, remember to keep it sharp, but more importantly, keep it safe. Look after yourself, look after your tools. And I look forward to uh, the next room we have together on the YouTube Carbotech channel and the wonderful world of woodworking. Till then, I bid you all good day, good afternoon, good night, and happy woodworking. Bye for now.